In the time you've been CEO, what are one or two of the major setbacks? Were there moments when you thought, oh my God, this is, we're taking on too much, I can't do this, it's too difficult to reach this community, we can't get money or partners to do the right thing because of the difficult uh, sell-in prospect we've got here? Well, I think that actually, because we just finished our series, our third round, um, sort of after the market kind of crashed down and, and through the summer, I think because it's harder to raise money for Planet Out, we had, in raising money for Series B, we had just slept through that and been and knocked on every door. That raising Series C, we kind of hung in there. It was, it seemed like business as usual, whereas I think some of the other companies were not as used to having to just push so hard to convince people and just try to find someone. Um, let's see, this, this summer as we were closing our Series C, we had one VC have to pull out uh, because, um, even though they had completely approved the deal, all the partners had voted. Uh, they had, you know, with us, they always go to the investment bankers like Mary Meeker and Lanny Baker and Liz Beyer, who was at CSFB and is now VC, who have been incredibly supportive of Planet Up. They always go to them and ask, could this company ever become a public company? What can be the exit strategies? Would it be acquired? Because they, we are pioneers in the gay and lesbian space. So they'd done, crossed every T, dotted every I, and then uh, they got blocked by their limited partners, 20% of which come from Saudi Arabia. So we had that uh, VC firm not be able to invest because they couldn't, they, they didn't want the, the, that group of 20% to pull out. So we things like that happen. But you just, you know, you just keep going. Is there something now, as you look towards the future, that, that keeps you up at night with concern or anxiety as you think about this business? I think that it's, it's not so much about um, an if. It's very clear to me the company is is, uh, is viable, strong. We can build a, a very large and, and incredible company. Just making sure we do the staging right. You know, don't build certain things too soon before they're ready. Um, that's the important stuff. Uh, just staging, paying attention to customers, making sure we don't lose, you know, touch with what people want, um, and start building, you know, too much of uh, rich media before people are ready to access, access that with slower modems. One of the big issues for anyone managing an internet business, but especially one in the Bay Area or Silicon Valley, is of course attracting great people, mm -hmm. convincing them actually to take the job offer and sticking around. And there, of course, with the correction of the NASDAQ and a lot of people who might have been a little too risk averse to be in a startup, mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden start to wonder, will the options be worth anything? Should I go back to a more conventional business, get a higher base salary and so forth? What's your human resource strategy? Um, a couple of things. Certainly, as, as the market shifted, we saw one or two folks say, OK, yeah, I want to go back into uh, calmer places. But I think that sometimes, because Planet Out is doing not only internet and business and media and, and e-commerce services and member pro, uh, premium services, stuff that you know, we all love to work on on the business side or an engineering side or um, marketing side, but it also has this, this angle of giving back into the community, to the customer, serving sort of a social agenda. I think a lot of people are excited about coming to the company. We see that in gay and straight employees, people who want to come and be part of something that seems bigger. It's part of a major change. I think the key is, like anything, getting out there and telling your story and trying to find folks. It, it's tough to find great people, but they're out there. So again, be persistent. Do you worry in a fast-moving dot-com business like this, especially when it's doing well and it's gotten rounds of funding and has you know all these wonderful ramp-up statistics, how do you keep your folks from living the paradox or the irony of having totally unbalanced lives that are thoroughly dominated by work while you're operating a site that's actually ha helping a significant proportion of the population actually have a good, healthy life? Really important stuff. Early on, we set up um, uh, four weeks vacation. And we really work on people to make sure they take at least some of that. If you give them more, then at least they take part of it, you hope. We also try to stage projects so that there's an intensity, and then we back off a little bit. There's an intensity, and we back off. So I think that you can pace yourselves. Um, especially after five years, you want to sort of turn down the, like, we're going to work 24 hours a day every day. The intensity rolls through the company. Different groups have different uh, projects that they're working on at any given time. Are you good at practicing what you preach on that dimension? Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, you know, I love what I do so much that you can get very much you know, revved up into it. But also, at, at some level, there's a diversity to what I work on, um, both across the business and the whole range of different people that I'm interacting with. So that sort of balances things some as well. 
Megan, let me ask you, as, as an internet entrepreneur and somebody who's spent time at the MIT Media Lab and invented solar cars and bike locks and all kinds of extraordinary technological innovations, what do you think is the next big thing? Um, actually, maybe it relates to Planet. I don't know if it's the next big thing, but uh, I have a good friend named Steve Perlman, who is, uh, and, and as you know, I'm a card-carrying optimist. So I'll and Steve this, Perlman, this it must be as well, because he's the guy who bootstrapped Web TV. Yeah, so he's the founder of Web TV and, and caused that all to happen. And Steve once said something really interesting to me, which I actually believe might be true, which is that um, his sense was if you could go, uh, um, you know, to the next millennium, you know, if you could go out a thousand years and look backwards at this 100 years and the next 100 years, that people at that point would look backwards and say, oh yeah, there was this huge amount of technological innovation, the airplane, the internet, the radio, uh, telephones, um, you name it. His perspective, and I think I agree with it, was that the, the bigger change that will be seen from that vantage point is the change in the human race and the way, the, the many more voices that came to the table. Women got the vote sort of the turn of last century. And then you saw sort of the civil rights movement in the 60s still getting there. You see the gay rights movement. You see the women's movement. You see the men's movement. You see sort of this huge change that's going on. And I, th I think the technology is influencing that. You see Tiananmen Square and how the fax machine changed exactly what happened with those people and the atrocities sort of happened but then stopped from, you know, the escalation stopped. There's a lot of bad stuff still going on and it's going to continue. It's in our nature. But I think that one of the major things that is happening that when you can sort of run out a thousand years and look back is that many more people are coming to the table. Certainly Planet Out represents the gay and lesbian people coming to the table at a global level. Um, and I think that's incredibly profound and incredibly exciting. And I think that technology has a big impact on why that's happening. Well, Megan Smith, thank you so much for talking with us. Sure. Thanks for having me. A quick update, Planet Out recently joined forces with its top competitor, Gay.com. Both companies say the merger will help them reach their goal of profitability by the end of this year.